The third speaker on this panel is Allison Franklin. Allison is a doctoral student in soil science and get this, talk about one planet, biogeochemistry at Penn State. So uh, Allison, please. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and I know biogeochemistry is always a mouthful. I always get people um, teasing me about that one. But it does really encompass everything that I do. So I'm going to be talking about something that's a little bit different than everyone else. I'm going to be talking about what's happening in the environment, specifically with antibiotics and antibiotic resistance, and trying to bring it into a One Health perspective. So this, I brought up this first slide because first it um, shows you exactly one of the things I'm looking at, antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. But I also wanted to emphasize the other contaminants that are going out into the environment at low levels. And there's been work showing that it's not just antibiotics that leads to antibiotic resistance, but there may be some of these other compounds in conjunction with antibiotics or even by themselves that lead to the emergence of antibiotic resistance. Obviously, I'm just going to talk about antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. Um, I'm going to be pressed for time just to talk about that in the environment. But I wanted to put that in the framework for you to also consider it's not just one thing. There's many different factors that play into this. So going right into it, antibiotics and how they're reaching the environment. There's really two main contaminant sources, and they go by the general um, names of point and non-point sources. And so this next diagram does a really great job of showing you a bunch of different point and non-point sources. And if the little yellow bursts, those are showing you where there's the hot spots of antibiotic resistance forming or disseminating. And so I'm going to start on the left-hand side left-hand side of the diagram. You see there looks like an animal there and some crops growing. And so essentially what would be happening there is you'd have manure applications, um, either just um, fertilizing the crops or just being deposited by the animals. Um, if the animals have received antibiotics, there's going to be antibiotics in there, possibly antibiotic resistant bacteria or genes. And then you'll have, if there's rain events, or irrigation, you'll have runoff that occurs. And you can see the arrows pointing down to a surface water. That's a big concern. You also have percolation down through the soil profile. Now that's a non-point source. If you go into the middle of the diagram, you'll see there's a hospital there, there's a pipe going to a wastewater treatment plant, there's an urban setting with cars, and from the urban setting you have another pipe going to the wastewater treatment plant, that's sewage, that's then going to get treated, but wastewater treatment plants aren't always designed to completely remove these compounds, and then you have that released into the environment. Here it shows direct release, direct, direct release into the surface water, but my specific area of study is actually reuse of wastewater treatment plant effluents, where you're actually using it for spray irrigation. Now, I'm at Penn State, and it's kind of atypical for that to be happening there in, in, um, uh, in Pennsylvania. However, if you go west, where there's more arid regions, California, where you have water shortages, you're starting to see reuse of wastewater, and so that's a concern. And that would also be considered a point source. And then, if you move over to the right-hand side, you'll have urban runoff, which is a non-point source. And then at the very right-hand side, you see it's a fish hatchery. And that can also be a source of antibiotics and antibiotic resistance going out into the environment. So if you probably noticed in the diagram, I talked about water a lot. And really, when you're talking about antibiotics in the environment and how it's poss possibly impacting human populations, animal populations, or just cycling through the environment, the focus is on water, because it is cyclical. And so I wanted to start with this diagram to just show you how that cycle might occur. And so if you start on the left-hand side, those are typical antibiotic sources. You have animals that are receiving antibiotics, you have people who are receiving antibiotics, and um, probably many people know, but if you aren't aware, when you take in an antibiotic, your body only metabolizes it to a certain extent, and then you excrete it. So when we're talking about human populations and antibiotics, it's not necessarily people flushing their antibiotics down the toilet, it's just the act of actually taking the antibiotic, and same with the animals. 
So you have these animals and people taking antibiotics, and they're going out into the environment. With animals, it's pretty much a direct release. Through the manure, it gets to the ground. Manure ne isn't necessarily treated to remove these compounds. With humans, you have it going typically through, a, to a, through the sewage to a wastewater treatment plant. And as I said, they're not completely removed. So if you look at the concentrations I have there of going into um, the wastewater treatment plant and then coming out, you can kind of see that the concentration ranges can be fairly similar depending on the compound. You're looking at nanogram per liter to microgram per liter range going in and possibly coming out. With manure, you're looking at milligram per kilogram ranges that are being land applied if it's used as a fertilizer or being stored somewhere. Then if you go looking into the environment, the potential places that can be impacted are surface waters, uh, soil, groundwater, and even plant uptake. And I'll go into more of that in detail in a little bit. And then finally, to bring it back to uh, humans and animals, if it's drinking water um, and it's public drinking water, it'll go through a uh, drinking water treatment plant. However, those aren't always necessarily designed to remove these compounds. Or if you have well water and there's something in the groundwater and you're not filtering, you'd have it there. And then with animals, typically you'll be taking um, maybe from a well, but maybe surface waters, things like that. So you have a quite great deal of, um, excuse me, you have a great deal potential for bring, bringing these antibiotics and antibiotic resistance genes back to populations. So I gave you a decent overview of well, what exactly happens once you have this treated wastewater. Um, I list biocells here, but I'm not going to really talk about that too much. Um, or untreated manure are released into the environment. And so first, I just wanted to briefly talk about um, aquatic environments. That's an environment that's been heavily studied with regard to antibiotics and antibiotic resistance and what's happening when you have these types of releases. And so typically you're looking at like wastewater treatment plant release, but you could have surface runoff um, from urban and agricultural settings. And the thing I wanted to point out is when it reaches the water, there's two main processes that'll uh, occur. Either the compound will stay in the water phase and it'll move along, or it's gonna interact with the sediments and perhaps stay in certain places. And whether that happens or not depends on the antibiotic compound and can vary by class. And that's what makes studying these compounds complicated, is that not all antibiotics are gonna behave the same. So if you just study one class of antibiotics, you can't necessarily say the same thing about another class of antibiotics. And so it's fairly variable. But, and you don't have to focus too much on the data here. I just wanna put up some data so you could, to back up exactly what I'm saying. So what happens when this, these releases are going into aquatic environments typically, and I'm talking about surface waters here. If it's wastewater treatment plant effluent or agricultural runoff or urban runoff, we see the same trends occurring with antibiotic contamination as well as presence of antibiotic resistance. If you look upstream, you're gonna see fairly low concentrations of antibiotics and low presence of antibiotic resistance, which is considered background resistance. When you look downstream of these inputs, you see increases in antibiotics and increases in antibiotic resistance. This has been well studied. We know this is happening, and it's definitely cause for concern. So that's what's happening in water, specifically surface waters. But what about antibiotics in the soil? So this is things like manure applications or irrigation with wastewater treatment plant effluents. And so essentially, after these um, the manure or the water has been applied, you're going to have the compounds go into the soil environment. And again, you're going to have um, one of three things that are going to happen. Either the antibiotic will stay in the water phase and slowly make its way down through the soil profile and perhaps reach the groundwater, or it's going to interact with the soil particles itself and be held up within the soil. Or you could also have the potential for plant uptake or plant translocation. And so this first graph here is actually data from my site. Um, it was recently published. And essentially what we're seeing here is that there's variable things that could happen. The concentrations of antibiotics in the effluents are fairly low. And it's really hard to predict exactly what you're gonna see. 
The site that I work with has been going on for 40 years. It's very long term. And what we found is if you look on the left hand graph, the green line and the gray line, that is antibiotic concentrations near the surface after eight months without effluent irrigation. So no irrigation whatsoever, and we're seeing some of these compounds be recalcitrant within the soil profile. They're just not going away. After one effluent irrigation, which is in the left-hand graph there is the, um, the red line, oops, sorry, the red line and the orange line, you see the con those are the same two compounds. You're not seeing much increase in the antibiotic. Um, compounds. So one effluent irrigation by itself doesn't seem to make a huge impact. But if you look at the repeated effluent applications, you start seeing increases in the antibiotic compounds. So the nice thing about this site is it's showing that maybe one effluent application doesn't have a, make a huge difference, but repeated applications do. The same cannot be said for manure applications. Those are pretty high concentrations in manure. Um, this has actually been very well researched just because we've always been concerned about manure and antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. But essentially, if you look at the background soil, which is labeled CK, you have a certain level of antibiotics. But if you look at the soils after um, dairy cattle or chicken manure added to it, you see increases in, antibiotic, in, antibiotic, in antibiotics. And that's been very well researched that we know that when you apply a manure, it has high concentrations of antibiotics, you're gonna see increases in antibiotics in the soil itself. And then finally, talking about plant uptake. Um, this is something that's new and people are concerned about the uptake of antibiotics into crops that we could be potentially eating or animals could be potentially eating. And this is a pot study, but I've done field studies too where we've seen similar results, where if you increase the concentration of the antibiotic compound in the soil, you see that the antibiotic compound is taken up into the plants, and the more you com the compound you add to the soil, the more it's taken up into the plants. It does vary by crop type. Um, I highly recommend if you are concerned about it, there's plenty of studies out there, um, and I think it's good information to know what could potentially go be go being taken up by our crops. And so that's what we're seeing with antibiotic concentrations in the soil, but what about effects to soil organisms? Now, this isn't specific about antibiotic resistance, but I wanted to point this out because I feel it's important that while you may or may not see increases in antibiotic resistance in the soil environment, by simply having antibiotics going out in there, you could be disrupting the nitrogen cycle, which is important for crop production. So while I do believe antibiotic resistance is definitely a threat, that's something else to consider too. But going on to talking about antibiotic resistance, the first thing I wanted to talk about is manure and land application. This has been very well studied, and we know that if you apply manure to soil, you're almost always going to see increases in antibiotic resistance, whether it's from the introduction of the antibiotics themselves or the introduction of antibiotic resistant genes or bacteria that was in the manure. And so here this, this figure just shows you the manure is the gray bar. It has a certain level of antibiotic resistance in it or antibiotic compounds. The background soil is the white bar, and you see it's a lower concentration. But then when you add the manure to the soil, you see increases in the antibiotic resistance. And that's fairly consistent whenever you're looking at environmental studies. Now this data is from my study site, Those, so this is effluent applications, lower levels of antibiotics going into the environment. Um, there's been conflicting results from various different studies as to whether effluent applications actually lead to increased resistance in soil environments. Some studies show no increase in resistance, some studies do show increases in resistance. So with these low levels of antibiotics, we can't necessarily predict exactly what's gonna happen. And it does seem to be specific to the type of antibiotic resistance. And I just wanted to show you this figure. If you just wanna look at zero to five um, centimeter depth, um, and I'm going to compare it with another figure in a second. So this is one uh, gene that is associated with antibiotic resistance. And if you look at zero to five centimeters, and the black bar is a crop site, has no direct irrigation. It's actually similar to the control sites. 
So you're not really seeing much difference between those two sites with regard to antibiotic resistance. So we consider that background, the natural background that you would see. However, if you look at the two middle bars, that is a crop depression site at 15 meters from spray irrigation after one week of irrigation and 10 weeks of irrigation. And you're seeing increases in the antibiotic resistance due to that irrigation and the presence of the antibiotics there. However, if you look at another resistant gene at the same site and you look at zero to five centimeters, you can see that there is not necessarily a significant difference between the control sites and the applicate for the site that's receiving application of effluent. And I just wanted to bring that out because you can't just look at one thing and say that there is um, an impact or there isn't an impact. It, at least with um, effluent irrigation, it seems to be more variable than you would have with manure applications. And so briefly, I just wanted to point out that groundwater could also be impacted at my site. I do look at groundwater. Right now, I've only analyzed um, concentrations of antibiotics. I haven't analyzed antibiotic resistance yet. That'll be probably for a postdoc, <laughs> since I'm finishing my PhD soon. But I just wanted to point out that we are seeing concentrations of these antibiotics reaching the groundwater. It does depend on the compound. The compounds that are more water-loving, that'll stay in the water phase, make their way down more so than the ones that are hydrophobic or don't like water. Um, but the nice thing is we are seeing at least a thousand-fold um, decrease in antibiotic concentrations going from the influence down to the groundwater and definitely lower than what you're seeing in the soil environment. So the soil at our site is doing a decent job of remediating the antibiotic compounds. It'll be interesting to see what I find with looking at antibiotic resistance. And there, isn't, there hasn't been a whole lot of work done on looking at antibiotic resistance in groundwater, but it's an area of emerging concern, especially people have groundwater wells. And so that's just a general overview. I know I put in a lot of information for 15 minutes, but I wanted to give you a complete picture of essentially the state of the science of antibiotics and antibiotic resistance in the environment. What effects in humans and mammals, we really don't know. And that's why having these types of symposiums where we're bringing both people from the medical field, um, research, um, medical research, and then also um, environmental research is really important because I can't say for certain what these low-level antibiotics and antibiotic resistance in the environment means to human and animal populations, but I do think it's a concern. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention.